Ladies and gentlemen, today we are building something quite ridiculous because on our desk we have a vending machine. No, sorry, wait, not a vending machine. This is a gaming PC chassis. This is from Thermaltake. It's called the Tower 200 and it is a little bit unusual. It's a little bit smaller, but it actually takes the most powerful gaming PC components you can build. And to prove this, we're going to put a 3900 KS paired with an RTX 4090 inside this thing. Of course, we're going to show you the full build process from start to finish to show you what's hot, what's not, and how easy it is to build inside. And then of course we're going to be showing you those all important gameplay benchmark numbers so you know exactly how this thing performs. So let's see if this thing is any good, right after a short word from this video's sponsor. Corsair's K70 Max is a game changer for mechanical keyboards. Forget about what colour switch to go for, Corsair's new MGX switches lets you customise the actuation point of your keyboard. Want a super soft touch for fast reactions, or do you prefer more force to stop mistakes? Ultimately the choice is all down to you. Learn more about the K70 Max today with the link down below. Right then ladies and gentlemen, I guess it is now time to start and I must admit I am a little bit outside of my comfort zone here because I haven't built in something that looks quite like this before but we have actually read the instruction manual this time so in theory I'm well equipped to actually talk to you about it. I've learned from my mistakes, how about that? And at first glance it doesn't appear as if any of these panels are particularly tallest. However, if you read the manual you'll know that you open up this back piece and you can actually put, well not on this bit, on the top you can put up to a 140 radiator on here which is going to prove useful if I do decide to water cool in this case assuming it's actually possible and then the panels themselves will just pop off like that and that is pretty clever because obviously it makes it a little bit harder for them to come off day to day but then when you want to access it's very very easy and if you tilt it on its side you then find the remaining thumb screws to get these bottom compartments off and away as well. I mean, you probably won't need to take all of these out, which is why they're not tallest. But personally, when I'm doing a build, I like to get it as minimal as possible as it does make the whole process a fair bit easier. Don't lose these, by the way, because they're not captive screws. But that, of course, does still leave the glass. Let's see if I can actually work out how to get this out. Oh, no. I think it pops and then lifts. But anyway, once you have done that, you will start to see what we have on offer and it's quite a clever chassis actually I can't really fault the layout at least in theory because this does only support an ITX motherboard but when it comes to GPU compatibility it's this massive slot here and the main change that they've made versus the 100 is to make this full mesh versus before it was sort of half glass and half mesh which I don't think properly worked on like top-end GPUs for best cooling so now that it's mesh you can pretty much fit I don't want to say anything in here I mean let's do this now, let's grab the largest card I have, which is the 4090 Aorus Master. We get rid of our bag of screws, and then let's see exactly what you can fit inside this case. I mean, obviously it might change once you fit other components inside here. There you go. That is an Aorus Master 4090 inside an ITX enclosure. I mean, is it cheating? Slightly. But you can't argue that's impressive. I mean, let's see if we can actually use this later. I was going to use the FE. Now, if you are following the manual, it does say the first step is to put the power supply in, but I don't really understand why you'd want to do that, because then you'd have all of your sort of cables floating about. This is a full proper ATX power supply, by the way. Obviously, you can put SFX in there, but don't really see why you'd need to do that unless you're transferring an existing. And the board that we're using here today is not actually the one I'd recommend, because I think this is now discontinued, so buy the newer version of this, the Z790. But the one I have on hand is this. It's the 690 from ASRock. It's their Phantom Gaming ITX. I use this quite a lot, actually, in the mesh room build and didn't really have any issues with this at all. But this is, of course, an Intel motherboard, and it will support the latest gen of Intel CPUs as long as you do a BIOS update. But this, of course, does have USB BIOS flashback, so it is just a case of downloading the latest BIOS from the website, putting it on a USB flash drive, powering it on, and pressing the button and letting it do its thing. Little bit. Letting it do its thing. That is quite hard to say very quickly. Try it. Letting it do its thing. See? So let's pop this on top of the box, and we will grab our CPU. This is the 3900KS. This is that sort of special edition Intel CPU that most people shouldn't really buy. Just stick with the normal 3900 or even the i7-13700. But if I'm honest, Intel hasn't asked for this back yet, and I want to do something crazy, and I'm thinking if I water cool it, especially with Hardline, they might be like, yeah, fair enough, PC-centric can just keep it. It's too much hassle for him to give it back. Smart thinking. The only problem with this approach, beside the fact that they might make me destroy my lovely Hardline 
PC, if we ever get that far, is that because this is an ITX motherboard, this one only has an eight pin power connection up here at the top. I mean, I did look it up and I think you can get around about 380 watts out of an eight pin. So performance is gonna be absolutely fine, but this can consume an awful lot, especially if you're gonna to wanna to overclock it. So I imagine the type of buyer that would normally buy this is probably wanna go for a motherboard that does have an eight plus four. But when I had a look, I couldn't really see any. If you find any, let me know down in the comment section below. And is it even gonna matter? Maybe that's something we have to test. So let's open up our slots and then grab our CPU, gently drop it into place. Give it a bit of a push to hear that somewhat unsatisfying noise, especially if you've not really built PCs before, and then remove the top cover. As for the RAM, I would recommend a minimum of 32 gigabytes for this rig. Obviously you can go for 16, but bear in mind we only have two DIMM slots. I don't really think that's a wise decision. I mean, if you're going for something really high end, then it's probably worth getting 64 or maybe even 48 at the gate. But the kit that we're using here is brand new to the channel and it is actually from Thermaltake. It's part of their tough RAM series. To be fair, it's definitely a little bit different, isn't it? It does stand out from the crowd. You still have RGB on the top, and this is a kit of two, totaling a speed of 6200 megahertz if you're using XMP. The only thing I will say about it is that it is a touch on the high side. So if you are using like a lower profile CPU cooler, do be aware you might want to grab something lower. Do the same with the other side. Once that's in, we are of course going to want to remove our SSD cover. Then we can go ahead and pick up our SSD. And this is a brand new one from Sebrant. It's a kind of sequel to their Rocket 4 Plus. This is the gaming edition. It's not the absolute fastest that you can go for, but obviously at the moment it's not really gonna be the end of the world. Pretty much any fast Gen 4 drive should be absolutely fine. But obviously if you're going for Ryzen or something that does, it's worth considering, but this is pretty much gonna be the sweet spot really in terms of price and performance. To be fair though, the only thing I probably would change is to make this a larger capacity, because obviously the downside of going for ITX is not only that you just have two RAM slots, not four, but also you are reduced in the amount of SSDs that you can actually support because I think this is just two yeah one on the front one around the back right then that is our motherboard complete so it is time to get this installed in our chassis I was gonna try and use the overhead and then I've remembered there's a fan there I mean we have to take it out anyway right well at least you get a better view from the overhead now as we drop this down into place line it up with those holes realize our RAM isn't seated properly then we can screw it down into place I mean, to be fair, before we installed the motherboard, it probably would have been worth doing the backplate for the CPU cooler, but luckily, Thermaltake do at least give you the option of removing this plate from the back and then still maintaining great access to the back of the motherboard. Let's not make any more mistakes, Marcus. Let's do it in the exact order now that they say. VGA next. I would have gone CPU cooler personally, but I'm gonna trust the manual. Oh, Marcus, you never use the manual. Who's a manual? And of course, we're going for our master, the most overkill GPU you I think you can get right now this one is from gigabyte so let's remove the slot covers I mean to be fair this is probably why they say put the power supply in first because if you are going to run into any clearance issues you'd already know about it yes yes it is Woo! I hope we still do have room for all of those power supply cables but as I say we can remove it if we do want to go for something smaller right that is screwed in let's have a look oh it's got heavy now <laughs> what that has done to our rig I mean look this will go back on and there's still loads and loads of room for the GPU to breathe. So this is why I said at the start of the video, I think this is a really clever case because it allows you to do kind of weird, crazy things like this in what is still a very small footprint. I approve. I mean, actually, no, no, I, I more than approve. I really like. I think it definitely is time though to quit while we're ahead and actually install our power supply because if we have made a mistake, it's better to know early. And the exact power supply that we have is the Tough Power FP3 from Thermaltake. This is 80 plus platinum, 1200 watts. This is actually still very overkill for this rig. But to be fair, if you're going for 4090 and a 1300 KF, this is probably what this was designed for. But I think most importantly for me, this is one of the latest gen power supplies that does come with the new Gen 5 connection. So you can hook this straight up to one of these NVIDIA graphics cards without requiring an adapter. It definitely would have been nice if all of the cables matched though. If I unbundle them, you'll see that our Gen 5 cable doesn't actually match up with the rest. And this is something that I've seen on a few different power supplies. I don't really understand why, but surely there's a better system than this. Let's get everything plugged in. Remove and then attach the PSU shroud bracket. Once you've done that, you can then feed the cables through 
into the bottom chamber. You want the fan facing downwards on this one. And then now comes the slightly more tricky bit of actually getting all of these cables plugged in. Maybe don't screw it in straight away and route some of the cables first. Oh no, no, I'm being silly. I'm, I'm, I'm being silly, you can route them around the back. There you go, yeah, that would be a whole lot easier because then you're not gonna see them at all, are you? Let's start with our graphics card, shall we? One single connection, especially in a case like this, makes it so much easier. I'm just routing the ATX, but I will of course show you what I'm doing. You can see they just come down the bottom from the chamber, up through the back, bring it round to the main chamber, and then plug this into the huge hole on your motherboard. If you look carefully as well, you do actually have these little cable tie down points as well. This case so far, I have to admit, is absolutely fantastic. But I mean, I don't think I've used a case in years that is as well thought out as this one is so far. That hopefully was now the hardest bit done. All we really need to do is get the all-in-one liquid cooler installed and also do our fans. And we're gonna start with that because more clearance is better. These are the tough fans from Thermaltake. They're not the upcoming magnetic ones though. Those would be quite cool to see. I think we only need two of these. Maybe one at the back as well. And there we go. That is a lot of RGB. That is a very unusual design actually. The RGB is very much built into the frame here. Let's get it installed. We'll feed the cable through in advance and then it should just be a case of dropping this one on. Obviously making sure that it is blowing the way you want it to. You will need to use the screws that actually come with the case for this because you're sort of screwing down into the chassis through the fan rather than the traditional way. Let's then do the same with our top fan. Those are now on, which means it's time to move on to CPU cooler. And the one that we have here is the Ultra 280, of course, from Thermaltake. And obviously the whole idea is that the fans match up and you can control them all with one bit of software. The other cool thing about this is not that it's got loads of plastic bags in it that I'm starting to call brands out on now because it's not good for the planet and I don't see the need. But the other cool thing about it is that it does have one of these LCD displays and these are getting really popular now. Even for like hardline liquid cool builds. I see like Corsair have got Hydra X with LCDs and things in now. So clearly this is what people want. Oh. Oh, that's not so good. I mean, that's definitely got to go. Can the fan fit in there? I imagine so. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you can put the fan on top. That's not a problem. So fans are on. I will try one more time, but I think resistance here is futile. Okay, so let's try again. That looks a lot more like it, doesn't it? And I know we're probably cutting out quite a lot in this video while I'm sort of thinking everything through, but there is definitely room for a 120, no questions asked down here, but the screw holes don't quite line up if you want to do that because they almost want to sort of push that way a bit. You know what, I am committed to this. I'm going to see if I can fit a Fantex T30 down at the bottom and whether there are any screw holes for me to fit this in. So we're gonna have to leave this as a bit of an artist's impression because unfortunately you can only fit one of these in properly. Having said that, if you do have some screws and bolts, there's no reason you couldn't actually use this mesh underside just to get it safe and secure that way. I mean, that would work. So I guess we do that for the water cooling build. So that's enough mucking about, let's actually Get this sorted now and install our Intel backplate. Says no mucking about, immediately starts mucking about. Intel 1700 backplate now goes on. And yes, this would have been a lot easier if we'd done this on the motherboard at the start. But again, that's why you watch these videos, so you know. Then you grab these little silver screws, screw it on top. And then when they're all on, you can tighten them up with a screwdriver. I think we're almost there. Just our CPU fan header to plug in. Of course, it turns out we needed Molex as well for the RGB fans, not SATA. So I'm gonna have to swap one of the power cables over. And then once you have sorted that, you'll have this little hub that's gonna be used for all of your RGB fans. It does both fan speed and RGB, which is nice. And you can connect up to five fans to a single controller here. Just do be aware that these will only work with Thermaltake fans though. You can't sort of mix and match with other four pins or things like that. And because we have so much space down here at the bottom, I'm not even gonna do this particularly neatly. I'm just gonna stuff all of these cables pretty much in the bottom chamber. Remember, you won't see any of these once you put the panels back on. Which I think means there's just one more thing to connect, which is our USB 2 to the header on the motherboard. Which actually means our rig is pretty much complete. Here is our tower 200 build from all of the sides, including the back. I mean, when have you ever seen the back of a PC so well cable managed without any work whatsoever? The secret really was just by having these two channels all the way down 
that you can tuck all of the cables into. I've also put this back piece on as well. I think this would be quite a nice area if you did want to use like some third party controllers and you didn't want to stuff it in the basement and then just attach them here. You could have a couple and neatly do all of your fans that way. But I have to admit, I'm really impressed so far. It really is just this fan and this fan not having the easiest mounts in the world that made my life a little bit more difficult. But other than that, I have to admit, I don't think I've been this impressed with a case in a long, long time. The time has come to see exactly how easy this thing goes back together. I mean, I was gonna remove this fan because I'm not really interested in using it. I don't think there's anything there that needs cooling. But I'll leave it on just so we can see if this would fit nice and easily which indeed it does. Which I now think pretty much just leaves the top, but you should absolutely be aware that the main problem with the chassis is that all of your IO is gonna be facing upwards, including that GPU, which means you're gonna need extra long cables in order to achieve the same sort of runs, I suppose, just because you've got to add all of this to your existing cable run, which isn't necessarily a problem, but if you are the sort of person that is constantly sort of tweaking USBs and plugging things in, this will start to get annoying, but it's more easy accessible on the top than it is on the underneath, but as I say, you do need extra cable lengths, so buyer beware. And so, for the final time, hopefully, here is our finished rig in all of its glory. I mean, I do want to turn this on, but I'm well aware that it probably won't work because we will need that BIOS update. So here comes the nerve wracking bit then. So we grab our now much larger 32 inch 4K monitor. We'll plug this in over DisplayPort and now you can start to see what I mean about cable length. This is not a short cable at all, but this kind of just lingers now. We'll grab the latest version of our ASRock BIOS and we'll place this into the USB port that says BIOS on it. We'll plug our computer in, make sure it's actually powered on but not turned on. Then we hold down the BIOS button for three seconds and then it starts to flash. And you just have to wait until that light stops flashing. Do not disconnect the power cable, turn everything off, wait until it either stops or it goes green. Oh, actually, while we're waiting, I've just realized the release notes for this BIOS says supports next generation processors. And this was from a few weeks ago. This isn't talking about 13th gen, it's talking about 14th. So dang, there you go. More future proof than we thought. Well, there was me thinking we had time to tidy up. The light has now gone off and I realize I probably should say this top piece does have a little removable cover. So if you do want to quickly plug something in, it's not the end of the world. You don't have to take this whole fascia off. But the BIOS light, has gone off. So I think we're ready to actually test this out. Wish us luck. Oh, oh. And those fans actually look so much better than they do in pictures. I thought they were gonna look a little bit tacky if I'm honest, but I mean, it's still pretty over the top RGB. But if you like that, I think it's done pretty well. I haven't even had time to plug <laughs> The PC Centric Mouse Mat, link to this is down below. We are starting to run a little bit lower now on numbers. Remember, once it's gone, it's gone. Go grab it today. I really want this to work, come on, come on. <gasps> oh. The fear started to come over me then, I'm like, oh no, I've spent so much time on this, but it's not working. But that is the splash screen of dreams right there. There we are, our 13900KS, 32 gigabytes of RAM. It's actually running pretty quiet at the moment, but I will do a little bit more tuning to it. I'll of course also enable our XMP profile. We'll grab a copy of Windows on a USB flash drive, save and exit, and then it should start with a Windows installer, which indeed it does. So we just need to go next a couple of times, basically, accept the license agreement. And then that's about it. Real simple. So just give me a couple of hours to get some games on this and we'll be right back. With the benchmarks, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a new dawn, a new day and a new t-shirt because I don't want to smell. Anyway, that is beside the point. We are all set up and ready to go. And honestly, I really love the way that this thing looks. I do think that it is potentially a bit cramped on the inside. This is the downside, I suppose, with going for something where you're, well, cramming a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, I, I don't like this little gap down the bottom. I'll be interested to see if we can fit a Micro ATX rig inside here. But especially if you are going to do something even more high end and start doing some liquid cooling is we're gonna sort of require a lot of thinking to get everything where you want it especially bearing in mind that you're probably gonna have to like double stack some fans and a radiator here and I don't know it, whether it will look too cramped is something I'm potentially worried about but that we will uh, cross that bridge when we come to it but let's jump into some games no actually no there is one other thing I want to say and that is that the thermal take software needs a lot of work it it's not the worst it's kind of like under middle of the road really just because it doesn't always 
do what you want it to do, which is a bit annoying, and then you realize it's because you maybe haven't selected all of the lighting zones and things. Basically, it's not very intuitive, and as far as I can tell, there's not really an easy way to actually get what you want on the LCD cooler. You can have it like cycling between like frequencies, temperatures, and things for your GPU and your CPU, but there's not really an easy way to have them like all displayed on screen at the same time. I mean, who wants to sort of sit and watch their cooler and wait for the infographic that they want to come up? You want to be able to see it all of the time. So something like NZXT and Corsair definitely do a better job here, but the cooler itself does seem to be doing a decent job of keeping cool and quiet. So the important bit is at least complete. But anyway, let's jump into our first title, one that's actually brand new for PC, some Ratchet and Clank Rift in Time. And this is a game that looks absolutely stunning. And it's one I tested earlier on a rig that had an RTX 4070 and it was struggling, but this is running with DLSS set to quality, no DLSS 3, pretty much everything maxed out, including ray tracing, and you can see we're getting 100 frames a second. So that is pretty incredible, because I know there are some people out there that won't want to use DLSS 3, but if we go into the options menu, uh, we'll find DLSS frame generation. I want to see if this actually works properly without causing some horrible stutter. This is why we're using frame view rather than MSI Afterburner at the top left of your screen. No, actually, this time this seems to be working absolutely fine. No issues whatsoever. I mean, what's that running at? About 140, 150 frames a second now at 4K max settings. And our latency is about 42 milliseconds. So generally I'll say anything under about 55, 60 is pretty much on the money. I mean, Cyberpunk is a bit of an exception really because that game is just so difficult to drive. But generally speaking, anything under 50 and you're laughing, you won't really notice a difference. What happens if we turn this down to 1440p, I wonder? We do just about start to see a little bit of CPU bottlenecking here. Even the 3900KS is not enough to play a game at 1440p with an RTX 4090, but to be fair, we've seen this in quite a few titles. I mean, it, it's almost there. We're hitting like 93% on the GPU utilization, so it's nothing exactly crazy. So yeah, about 160 frames a second. PS5, eat your heart out. Whilst we are waiting for our next game to load, we will put our side panel back on, and I will admit that it was actually very, very easy to put on and off. You literally just press here at the top, and there you go, it stays on, and we can do the peel. Eight out of 10, not bad. And this is the next game. Some of you might recognize this as some Deathloop. It's again, that game that I've got open and sometimes I catch up a little bit, but I'm still nowhere near actually finishing it. I really should get around to it. Too many games on the go at the moment, but this is running at absolute max settings, 4K. We've got DLSS set to quality, no DLSS 3 with this one as it was an AMD title but ray tracing is also cranked all the way up to max. And the reason I wanted to play this was because I haven't actually seen this, I don't think, running at the absolute highest quality settings yet. And on an RTX 4090, I was very interested to see what sort of performance we would get. And it doesn't disappoint. I mean, this is an absolutely incredible looking game. There is so much detail going on here. Whether the ray tracing is as noticeable in this game as on some others, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, you've got ray traced ambient occlusion and shadows here. So no reflections. But I really don't think you'd be able to argue that this is a fantastic looking game. And hey, if you're able to achieve 137 FPS at that highest resolution without having to worry about anything, I think we're all gonna be pretty happy. But I know what you're thinking, Marcus, why are you showing single player games? I only play multiplayer because I'm cool. Well, all right, this one's for you. This is some Halo Infinite as I try not to get shot. And this is running at proper true 4K resolution because there isn't actually any dynamic scaling from Nvidia or AMD in this one. There is like a built-in Microsoft one that to be fair works quite well if you need to use it. But for now, we're just going to go native. And I've got to admit, for a game that does look as good as Halo, I am once again very impressed with the frame rate, around about 150 to 170 frames a second running at proper true 4K. That is very impressive. And yes, I know you're not going to be running these settings really if you are sort of playing multiplayer, but if you think about it, this is 160 hertz monitor, so we're pretty much maxing this out and it's looking pretty stunning. But especially if you are gonna play the single player version of this game, I think it's nice to have the option of a little bit extra fidelity in exchange for I say a lower frame rate, I mean it's still 160 FPS. So how about we turn this all the way down to 1440p. We've got guests staying and I think they've just dropped a glass on my kitchen floor. Uh, but yes, anyway, that's not important right now. Instead, it's the frame rate and that's gone up to about 250, just shy of 300 FPS at max settings, 1440p with ray tracing disabled. So that is pretty nifty. 
Again, if you want to get like a super high-end monitor or something, 360 hertz, 1440p, then that is not going to be a problem here. But once again, I know what you're thinking. Oh, I don't play Halo. Why do you test Halo? How about we do Apex? Never happy, are you? And again, this is running at max settings at 4K resolution, and the frame rate is quite literally off the charts now. I mean, this is getting silly. We're looking at 200 and 30 frames a second at 4K max settings with this system. I mean, who's gonna be playing it at these settings? I don't know, but you can. As I say, this is a 160 hertz monitor, so there is pretty much no benefit really to lowering this down to 1440p. I mean, it wouldn't save me in this situation where there's three of them. But you get the picture. If you are realistically spending this much money on a rig, you're probably gonna be using a high resolution monitor, be it ultra wide or 4K. So it is definitely nice to have the option. And when you're achieving this level of frame rate, you don't even need to turn a couple of settings down, let alone the resolution. But I don't want any more whinging in this video. So just for show, let's see what happens if we turn this down. Remember, there is a frame rate cap on this game that you can't get rid of for 300 frames a second. So I'd be very surprised if we don't hit it. Yes, there we go. Spectating, because I've let the side down, squad eliminated, but yes, we are now hitting that frame rate cap of 300 frames a second. But crucially, we're looking at around about 62% on the GPU load. So obviously there would be a lot more in there. So if you do play games, I don't know, like Valorant or something, where you can let the frame rate quite literally go through the roof, then that's fantastic, get whatever monitor you want and you're gonna be absolutely fine. But yeah, I think all in all, this rig has no doubt impressed me. I mean, what's this? In terms of thermals and things, we're looking at about 73 degrees on the CPU, about 56 on the GPU. So despite its small frame, you're not gonna to have to worry about anything like that. Noise test. basically nothing. I mean, if you do have it on your desk, the problem with the GPU being here is that you are now right next to it, so it quite literally is going to be in your earshot. That is genuinely something to consider. But if you're after something that is a little bit different, you're happy to have ITX, but you still want to have a massive GPU, you no, know, I think you should strongly consider this case, because it's not going to be for everyone, but if you're considering it, then you know it's probably for you. Let me know your thoughts on this down in the comment section below. What do you make of it? Do you think it's quirky, or do you think it's hideous? Do you hate it? And obviously, what do you make of the pairing of the 4090 and the 13900 KS? If you've enjoyed this video, please smash the like button, get yourself subscribed, it really helps out. And as always, if you do want to check out current pricing on anything that's featured in this video, you can find it linked down below with our Amazon affiliate links. And while you're down there, why not bask in the glory of Corsair's K70 Max? This epic keyboard puts you in full control of the actuation force for complete customizability. You can even assign two different actions to each key press, one for a light tap, another for a heavy. The board also packs per-key RGB lighting, super smooth media controls, and axon processing for up to 8,000 hertz of polling rate. Get your game on today with the link down below. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.